you was maybe the greatest actor who ever appeared in front of the camera. Really? Yes. James Cagney? Yes. Why, why was that? What was this? Well, they... Cagney came on as though we were playing to an audience of 4,500 people. He acted at the top of his bet, and he never hammed for one moment. Thus proving my point that hamming is not overacting. It is false acting. It's fakery. Mm. And there's not a fake minute in a Cagney movie. Please have a season of him. Yeah. And study what, yes. what he was. Yeah. In fact, I was thinking the other day about the people I haven't interviewed, interviewed who I'd love to. And I think he comes so He won't come. I know. Uh, he's he a won't come. He won't. Complete recluse now, isn't he? Yes. Uh, well, no, but he won't come in front of a camera. So, may I must, I must ask you, it's the question that anybody who meets you must ask you. Did you ever say, you dirty rat? Never. You Not that I remember, no. You didn't. No, I kind of assumed that uh, I must have suggested it somewhere along the line. But I do think that the kid dead-end kids picked it up. Did they? And they made it, they popularized it. I, I think know. this is true. And what also, because you're the most imitated man in the world, I would imagine, what about the mannerisms, the sort of shoulder? Well, all those things, see, in vaudeville, you try to give the people something to go home with. And this thing that I did was something that I, that I saw a fellow on 78 feet and 1st Avenue do, oh, ages ago. And uh, he, that's all he did. <laughs> <laughs> He never, he never, he never worked for a living. He had a stable. <laughs> well, he made a living out of doing that. Oh yes, really? yes, truly. Really, I was uh, told that I was going to test for the part of Chang in the Good Earth. So I was put a thing on my head. So I was completely bald. I had a cue. I was stripped to the waist, darkened down. I and I. Uh, uh, I was to do the test uh, with Paul Muni, and the first thing Paul Muni said is, there's a hell of a tall Chinaman. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> what did, and so, uh, what they did, they dug a trench. <laughs> and, and Muni walked here and I walked in the trench. <laughs> the part. They, <laughs> they gave it to a Chinese person. <laughs> Did you know when you were uh, making that, that film Casablanca that it would one day become the, the cult movie that it is now? No, I certainly did not at all. It was a great confusion during the, the shooting of the picture. Is it true it was made in, in, in as you say, in some confusion haphazardly? I mean, nobody had a real yes. idea. No, we didn't have the script. It was written as we went along. And to tell you the truth, no one knew knew how to end it. So we went along uh, until the bitter end. <laughs> and it was very bitter because they said I should shoot it both ways. Either I should go with the husband in the plane, played by Paul Henry, or stay on the ground with Humphrey Bogart. <laughs> and it was very difficult to act out these love scenes because I really didn't know uh, which one of the two men I was in love with. <laughs> but it doesn't show. <laughs> no, it doesn't. I mean, he went off with the right fellow in the end. I think. How, how difficult was it uh, for you, Lauren, afterwards to, to live down the thing of just being Goldie's widow? I just think it's very boring in the press to continually talk about that. I mean, I did say once, and I'll say it again, hopefully for the last time, that being a widow is not a profession. No. And that you live your life the best you can, and uh, when a certain section of your life is over, you deal with it as best you can and that's very private mm. and then you have to press on and do something else for yourself because you're the only one that's left so i am entitled to a life of my own and i'm going to have it damn it in spite of you michael parkinson <laughs> i've often thought that one of the bravest moments in my life was one day i was just a, i don't know i was about 10 years old we were all sitting around the table my six sisters my mother and i my father was sitting, one of the rare moments that he was with us, and we were drinking tea in that time, out of a glass, Russian style, you know, and my father was breaking off a piece of sugar and <sighs> sipping the tea through, and everybody was frightened. He was just overpowering, and he was in a mean mood. And I don't know why, suddenly I took a spoon, and I took it into the, filled it with the hot tea, and I flicked it right in the <laughs> 
Well, I tell you, he grabbed me and he threw me. But I just felt so, I felt I did, you know, and it, and it sounds strange, but that is so vivid in my mind, and it's almost, it was, it's almost like an act that I feel saved me, that I dared to do something, yeah. and when you're that young, you think, you know, you, you actually think you're risking your life, yes, you know? Yes, it's yes. strange. I don't know what made me think of that. <laughs> <laughs> Can I talk to you for a moment <clears throat> about a man who also had a, an earlier and very significant effect on, on your life, and that was Cecil B. DeMille. Um, Indeed. Because it was the Ten Commandments, was it not, that really made you into um, a, a massive star. How did you first come to his notice? I was driving off the lot one day in a convertible with a top down and passed his building on the steps of which he was standing with some key members of his staff, including a secretary who, contrary to legend, did not take down everything he said, but took down a good bit of it. <laughs> and, uh, as I drove by, I saw him, of course, he was uh, instantly recognizable, and uh, thought, well, I met him, I suppose I should wave, so I waved, and he nodded graciously and waved back, and as was later reported to me, he then turned to uh, Harry Wilcoxon, his associate producer, and said, who was that? And Harry didn't know, and the secretary did, and flipped back, through her book, and she said, that's uh, Charlton Heston, a New York actor who was signed to do a picture by Hal Wallace. He made the picture. It's called Dark City. You ran it uh, 10 days ago. You didn't like it. <laughs> he said, uh, yeah, but I like the way he waved. <laughs> I believe that I have looked back too optimistically on Hollywood because my daughter has a, has a group of books about Hollywood that she bought. I don't know why, probably vainly looking for references of her father in them. <laughs> and uh, I took to reading them lately and I realized how many great people that town has destroyed since its earliest beginnings. How almost everybody of merit was destroyed or diminished and how the few people were good who survived, how, what a great minority they were. And I suddenly thought to myself, why do I look so affectionately on that town? It was because it was funny and it was gay and it was an old-fashioned circus and uh, everything that we're nostalgic about made it funny and gay when it was really happening. Yes. But really it was a brutal place. Yes. And when I take my own life out of it and see what they did to other people, I see that the story of that town is a dirty one, and its record is bad. I'd like to particularly ask you as well, because it's related to the film industry, about that period in your career in Hollywood when you were to the forefront of the people who were um, blacklisting the um, alleged communist members of... Uh, well, that's, that's, that's not a true statement. Well, what, what, we were not blacklisting. Well, you were... They were. They, they, they were. No, they were blacklisting. We didn't name anybody. We stayed completely out of it and said, we are Americans. But what about, say, somebody like Carl Foreman? Because a lot of those people who left Hollywood came to live here, of course, not a lot, but one, one, one or two of them, Foreman particularly. I read an interview that, that, that you gave, John, in which you said you objected to High Noon, to the film itself. You said it was un-American. Um, I saw that film, and I guess a lot of people here in this audience will have seen that film, and, and I, for the life of me, can't see what's un-American about it. Well, a whole city of people that have come across the plains and suffered all kinds of hardships are suddenly afraid to help out a sheriff because three men are coming into town that are tough. Now he goes to them and pleads them, and he goes into the church, and for some reason the women are all sitting on one side of the church, and the men are sitting all on the other side of the church, and he pleads his case. And the men say, no, 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 and the women get up and say, you're yellow, you're cowards. I don't, I don't think that ever happens in the United States. Then at the end of the picture, he took the, the United States Marshal badge, threw it down, stepped on it, and walked off. I think those things are just a little bit un-American. 